everyone. Uh, my name is Niranjan Anand. I lead marketing at Profin Solutions. Uh, welcome you all for today's webinar on technology at the heart of uh, financial inclusion in Africa, the ground to cover. Yeah. We have an impressive lineup of uh, panelists today who are looking forward to sharing a lot of valuable insights uh, with, with all of us. Yeah. Uh, now, now, with reference to uh, you know today's webinar, we all uh, recognize that uh, financial inclusion has gained importance since many years. All right. Uh, now, uh, United Nations uh, defines four focus areas. Uh, you know, as far as goals of financial inclusion are concerned. All right. Uh, uh, the first being access to access at a reasonable cost for all households to a full range of financial services, including savings or deposit, deposit services, payment and transfer services, credit and insurance. Uh, the second being uh, sound and safe, uh, uh, you know, institutions governed by clear regulation and industry performance standards. The third being financial and institution, uh, institutional sustainability to ensure continuity and certainty of investment. And uh, the fourth being, uh, you know, competition to ensure choice and affordability for clients. All right. Uh, so that's what United Nations uh, goals are with regards to uh, financial inclusion. Now, what is also interesting to see is in Africa alone, I mean, financial inclusion varies greatly across the continent, uh, you know, between uh, regions and also countries. Okay. For example, uh, you know, uh, uh, while 51% of uh, South Africans owned an account in uh, 2011, which is about 10 years back, only 11% of Central Africans did. All right. Uh, and uh, now with regards to formal uh, savings, uh, only 4% of North Africans, uh, you know, saved money at a formal financial institution, while 18% of Western Africans did. All right. And our experts today will, will discuss more about uh, other pertinent uh, aspects uh, specific to, you know, Africa. Yeah. So our conversation today, everyone brings together three organizations in the financial inclusion space. All right. Uh, uh, the African Development Bank, uh, Adoser uh, Microfinance Bank, uh, Savings and Credit Cooperative uh, Schemes, which is a SACO uh, Association of uh, Microfinance Institutions in Rwanda. Now, during today's session, we will provide uh, different perspectives, uh, uh, you know, of financial inclusion in Africa, uh, the regulatory landscape, guidelines, and best practices, uh, the challenges posed by the pandemic and uh, the road ahead, and uh, a shared and hosted services uh, technology model towards financial inclusion. Yeah. While we have only one hour for the discussion today, our panelists will try to cover all important aspects in each of the above uh, mentioned areas. Now, uh, during the webinar, the chat windows would be open. Uh, so please feel free to post questions to the panelists or any of us. And uh, uh, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce the panel today. Uh, joining me today from the African Development Bank uh, group, uh, the Digital Financial Services Specialist, we have with us Khalila Salim. Uh, from Adosa Microfinance Bank, uh, we have uh, the Head of Specialized Products and Partnerships, uh, Adekanabi Suan, with us. From Association of Microfinance Institutions in Rwanda, which is a SACO, we have with us IT Business Analyst for Shared IT Infrastructure, Amy uh, Mizyango, with us. And the moderator for today's session from Profin Solutions, uh, uh, you know, Prinal Gupta, who heads uh, the product growth uh, for Middle East and Africa for Profin Solutions. So Prinal, in fact, has been working with a lot of banks and microfinancing institutions, uh, uh, you know, in the region, and will be able to share his experiences also with, with all of you, right? Uh, now, let me have Prinal take over. Prinal, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Niranjan. Thanks a lot for this brief introduction. And I again uh, welcome everyone on board. I welcome the panelists. I welcome the all the attendees in uh, this uh, today's presentation. Uh, I hope uh, once we complete this presentation, the complete this webinar, uh, the attendees will have a good takeaway from the experience of our, uh, uh, you know, our attendees, our panelists uh, during the course of today's uh, 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 webinar. Now, to start with, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the global movement of uh, on financial inclusion has gathered pace as we know you know it has been uh, been years you know people have been talking about financial inclusion and we see that recently you know the financial inclusion has started ga gathering more pace now, as per reports uh, asia africa 
and Latin America have been in the forefront of this financial inclusive initiative. They have been taking uh, majority of uh, decision and majority of initiative towards, uh, you know, getting 100% financial inclusion, towards at least achieving 100% financial inclusion. inclusion. Now, if I talk about uh, the African continent in particular, no, now the African continent is now home to uh, more digital financial services deployments than any other region in the world altogether. You know, if, you, if I compare with the, all the global uh, deployments of financial uh, services, de financial services deployments, Africa is leading them, you know, in a, you know with, on a big time. Okay, and what does you know? What are the services this uh, uh, digital financial services are bringing on the table to the the population of African continent? The people, the mobile money solutions, and the agent banking uh, provide, uh, as we all know, affordable, instant, and reliable transactions, savings, credit, and even insurance opportunities in remote villages and urban neighborhoods where, in fact, uh, none of the commercial bank or the established uh, you know retail banks have opened a branch okay and uh, you know interestingly interestingly uh, you know uh, with the emergence of fintech the emergence of fintech the digital financial inclusion is flourishing okay it has led to uh, uh, a new and existing ideas where uh, you know which has aimed at improving the user experience the way we the the user the end user who is using the financial services has changed the experience has involved because of the uh, involvement of fintechs uh, and also at the same time with the increase in mobile uh, mobile phone penetration across you know, Africa, which we have seen a, a huge increase in the number of people uh, taking or you know uh, uh, availing a, a digital or a, uh, sorry a smartphone mobile phone, which has increased the penetration, uh, which has in fact uh, you know uh, it has helped the financial institutions to become more efficient in reaching to the end, end users and uh, provide a better service. Okay, with mobile wallets and obviously with increase in mobile wallet and with uh, mobile phone, with increase in mobile wallets, uh, wallets and mobile money transfer services, fintechs provide accessible op opportunities for low income clients. And, uh, you know, one area which I want to address is here is that uh, we all know financial inclusion as uh, something which we are, we are providing banking services to unbank. But one, one important point which I want to highlight here is apart from, apart from providing affordable banking, financial inclusion has a significant and a positive effect on entrepreneurship in Africa. That's, that's a big change which has, you know, financial inclusion has brought in the landscape, the, you know, the mentality of the people in Africa, Africa continent. You know, and by, you know, with the emergence of FinTech, by emergence of mobile tech, you know, and by adopting FinTech solutions such as, such as digital onboarding, coupled with KYC and loan origination, big data and machine learning, the, the the financial inclusion uh, the financial institutes have lowered the cost of credit risk assessment okay now what I, what it has done by lowering the credit risk assessment you know there is a new form of loan which is which we call digital micro loans have been emerging and are becoming extremely popular as an alternative to family loans where you know earlier people used to borrow money from the family and friends not because of this analytics because of big data machine learning and you know uh, online kyc People are moving towards digital micro loans, which can be afforded, which can be, uh, you know, offered instantly to the customers. So that that's a big game changer where it has led to the entrepreneurship uh, to the in the people of Africa. Now, also, also with that, uh, the fintechs are providing, you know, automated mid office processing solutions, which are helping financial in institutions to lower the operating cost. Okay, having said all those things, um, you know, in Africa, if I talk, I'm because our uh, topic for today is Africa. We are seeing a lot of initiative across the length and breadth with uh, microfinancing turning out to be the mantra to get businesses, individuals, and lesser privilege on a common platform with the rest. Now, these measures, these measures, there are multiple measures uh, which has been brought in by various governments and associations like, you know, which Amy is working with the SACO Association in Rwanda. So there are a lot of uh, measures has been brought in by the governments and association as well, which is really helping the large population of Africans, you know, people of Africa to move out of poverty. And obviously the technology is playing a vital role in helping to realize the, the real financial inclusion. 
but but when we say that you know there are technology enhancement there is a you know central bank regulations and association but when when we talk about when when it when it comes about regulations when it comes about guidelines when it comes about best practice practices so we want to hear you know what are the best trends what are the prevailing trends which is you know uh, which is in use which are the you know the people are using which is uh, you know transforming the financial inclusion landscape so on on this note i would request khalila selim to share her insights and perspective and what are the regulations and guidelines and best practices are shaping the financial in, uh, inclusion market so over to you khalila thank you so much and for the good introduction so without wasting any more time just a second i'm finding my mouse i'll take you through the regulatory landscape that is shaping financial inclusion in africa but just to recap uh, what uh, the previous uh, presenters have, have talking uh, spoken about financial inclusion in africa could be divided into three core components uh, there is the definition Uh, the components and then the enabling factors so typically financial inclusion i like to say it's never for the rich it's normally targeting the base of the pyramid they also called the mass markets or the unbanked population typically these populations earn more, less than 3 to 5 dollars a day so the value proposition for going digital has to be clear because they watch their money to the last cent Now if you're designing a service for them it has to be instant, timely and secure. If there's security issues they will not come back to your system. There has to be an intended outcome. So if you are moving farmers to a digital payment system or micro retail traders, what's the outcome? Are they making income or is there em uh, employment creation for the youth? So there has to be a purpose of why you're driving the financial inclusion. Now it's not necessarily free. Uh, right at the beginning you have to design a business model that scales the challenge with financial inclusion at the base of the pyramid you have to design a uh, micro or nano transaction fees which at scale makes sense because if you charge higher fees to use your system nobody will use but at the same time if you make it free it will not be sustainable so people take different models where the user end user pays or alternatively another party can come in for example if it's uh, agri uh, in agriculture sector the industry or factory owner may decide to pay on behalf of the farmers now what are the core components it's actually nano financing to be honest because uh, some of the loans that people take are like uh, less than 10 dollars in some cases even 3 dollars these are figures that if you go to mainstream banking uh, systems nobody will be able to translate because of the effectiveness of running these systems uh, it involves building a credit uh, a positive credit profile for the customer determining the suitability and applicability of the tech and financial innovation so quick to check are your users using smartphones or they are using feature phones and uh, what's their preferred uh, communication form then do market segmentation there's a lot there the base of the pyramid is comprised of farmers traders refugees uh, and uh, even the health uh, parents the health system patients etc what does that mean in terms of connectivity now you have to understand their behavior where and how do they get finance how do they save how do they spend etc before you design a solution else you you will design a solution that nobody uses Now some of the factors we've already had it's dependent on interoperable payment systems hence where the regulatory framework kicks in in addition to other components mobile access internet connectivity and the cash in cash out there's a caveat with the cash in cash out actually the essence of financial inclusion you need to lock the e value in when you have a lot of cash in cash out at every point of cash in cash out there's transaction fees meaning the user then ends up paying more but now to lock the e value in uh, is dependent on the merchant acceptance if people are not accepting the digital uh, format of the money then you still have to do cash in cash out now typical solutions designed for financial inclusion there's stand alone like uh, what my previous speakers have said around uh, loan systems where you can you can log into a mobile app and you get digital loans instantly or you have an ecosystem approach where a solution is linked to the agriculture sector to the trade sector and and the related elements but then even we, because we are here on technology technology is at the heart of what we do 
technology and financial inclusion takes different form. There are people who provide platform, there are people who provide cyber security, agency interconnectivity, etc. So you need to determine where are you falling and uh, how, how is your solution classified. Based on the classification of your solution, then you determine which set of laws and which set of end users you're targeting. Uh, so quick one, there's a lot of laws, but I've just picked the critical ones that uh, are uh, applicable to this session. So in any country, you'll find a payment systems act. It takes different form or different names, uh, depending on which country you're in. Cyber security has become more and more prominent. Sometimes it falls under the payment systems act, but some countries have also spinned it up as a standalone policy. There's Consumer Protection and Competition Authority Acts, which is critical because uh, they regulate the price setting, for example, and the branding and other related elements like interparty costs or interchange costs. You have acts uh, governing issuance of e-money. Who is allowed to, uh, to issue e-money? Is it the banking sector? Is it the mobile network operators? Are there fintechs? So depending on which countries you're in, it actually elaborates and, and allows, allows even some of the private sector and including even the non-profit making sector to be able to issue some form of e-money. And then there's agency banking regulation. This is also notorious for being sometimes included in the Payment Systems Act, but also some countries have spinned it out and uh, it, it brings out the rules around agent interoperability, the supervision by the respective body, which in this case is the central bank, as well as the other related elements of uh, what are the price setting, the commission structure, etc. Now, uh, where does financial inclusion fall? So in financial inclusion, you have two possibilities. Because mobile money is key, you have interoperable mobile money systems. And interoperable mobile money systems sometimes do not necessarily uh, depend on an, uh, an, uh, uh, on a system that a country has set. You'll find three or four companies have come together, mobile money operators, to agree bilaterally or multilaterally to set up interconnection between themselves. This was the uh, good case in Tanzania, which was led by Tigo and brokered by IC, where the mobile money created their own switch that uh, routes uh, interconnectivity between the different operators. Now they're in the process of linking it to the bank-led model. Now there's also the bank-led model where you have the bankers association, et cetera, who come together and they set up a switch, like in the case of Kenya and IPCL and PesaLink, and then they allow other parties to link in. So whatever country you're in, make sure you understand how these core systems come in and where you want to pitch. Is your solution targeting uh, mobile money interoperability only? or do you want to link in circles, MFIs, as well as banks? Depending on what you want to do, then you have to determine where you want to pitch. Now, the regulations impact financial inclusion decisions at the macro and micro level. We'll see that in a little bit. But there's also a caveat. Uh, the ecosystem is notorious for spinning out financial inclusion strategy. There's Communications Authority Act and many other Vision 2030, which will also have some uh, financial inclusion in it. So you need to navigate the, the regulatory landscape and see where the harmonization, where is contradiction? Because you could be aligning yourself to one policy, but it contradicts itself. For example, the Payment System Act uh, typically states any organization that is giving a, a critical financial services should have a cyber security uh, chief uh, uh, information security officer in place in addition to a percentage of the revenue for, uh, to be allocated to support cyber security events. But at the same time, the cyber security policy will spin out the details. So you need to, to, to synchronize between these policies to make sure you don't, you don't find yourself on the wrong side of the law with the regulator. So what are the components that drive financial inclusion? So depending on the, on the system that you have, which is the interoperable system, because why are we focusing on interoperable systems? If you are a service, uh, say a country A has MTN, has Airtel, has Safaricom, and the, the customers want to trade seamlessly between each other. And then they also have bank A, bank C, bank D. 
they, they do not want to change their accounting or their, their mobile account or their banking account to be able to trade with you. They would prefer to stay where they are, but given the access to trade across all the different segments. But that interoperability doesn't come cheap. It comes with investment in infrastructure. And that infrastructure includes the scheme, which uh, covers the governance, the operational requirements, the rules that govern how money will, uh, will, uh, will move from point A to B, and will be responsible for all the related issues. Whether shareholders will come in place, put in money to support the, uh, the construction of the switch, and what their role in decision-making in that financial setup will be. Now, once that scheme is in place, there comes the technology, which now switches uh, the, uh, the, the clearing of transactions and settlement options, as well as fraud monitoring, which is key. Now, here, uh, depending on who, who works on this, you can either have direct or indirect participation uh, in terms of investment that you have put on board. Then you have settlements. This can be done either in real time or deferred final settlements. A lot of the instant retail payment systems that are targeting financial inclusion systems are actually real time. Hardly most of them use deferred, but in the banking sector or the banking led model, most of them work on deferred uh, final settlements. And the issue around this is really how to manage liquidity and make sure you don't overcommit based on the instant payment and exchange of funds after the clearing of the processes. Now, users of uh, the systems that include uh, banks and non-bank uh, solutions include customer, businesses, governments, uh, merchants, and agents. We also have financial institutions like the banks, electronic money issuers, and fintechs. Fintechs here is broad. It covers all the small, the big, the middle, and also the startups, because uh, depending on how you define fintech, it's actually a very broad uh, category of organizations that offer financial solutions and technology. Now, what are the core uh, roles linked to the Payment Systems uh, Act, and why should you care? So number one, we have the overseer. In any country, this is the central bank. They will set out the rules and the regulatory framework that will promote safe and efficient payments. They will work on supervision mechanism, and they will facilitate any required changes. Sometimes, uh, always in some countries, some countries, the, the banks or mobile money operators themselves will lead an initiative to change a regulation. Some need a carrot and stick. So the regulator needs to, to balance where, when to push people and when to support a process that has, has already started working. Then we have the payment scheme manager. So a lot of countries combine payment scheme management with switch operator management. But then this differs. A country like Mexico combines everything under one, same to Jordan. But other countries uh, have separated it like South Africa where the scheme manager and the payment switch operators are different. So you have the bank serve and the pastor which now uh, passes this, uh, the, the payments. Now, what does it mean to be a scheme manager? Anybody can actually lead a, a scheme and a switch. This could be private entities, associations like the Bankers Association, FI Association, or non-profit entities, or central bank. You will notice across all the four options, central bank actually appears. Whatever you do, whether you're leading a, an initiative or complementing an in initiative that is going through, central bank has to be on board. Now, the scheme management and governance will typically outline the shareholding structure of the scheme and who is allowed to participate. And if you're participating in that scheme, how much do you contribute? Is this scheme for uh, profit making or not for loss making? Then there's the rules governing the payment uh, switching, as well as the strategic steering and development of the switch. Now, the scheme, sorry. And then uh, you have the operator. This is where technology also comes in at the payment switch. You need complex technologies to support the alternative uh, uh, digital payments channels to be able to interchange. And uh, there's uh, uh, laws around uh, how the message formatting will exchange to make sure you get uh, the, right the right payment to the right person at the right time. And then lastly, you have settlements. Once you've confirmed participants A and B are sending money and the money is available in the account and whether uh, they are ready to pass the transaction, the settlement agent comes in and they facilitate that final uh, change between uh, banks and interbanks. So against this background, 
what matters to financial inclusion? So when you are looking at the payment schemes in the country, whether it's mobile money interoperability scheme, which is linked to a banking scheme, or whether it's a bank, banking scheme that also interconnects with the mobile money, you need to understand the mode of participation that is allowed. Direct uh, participation may sound fancy, but it also has implications because when people come together to design a payment scheme, they agree to share the, uh, the cost of the scheme as well as the profits and the losses. So if you're just uh, uh, coming up as a startup who wants to do a quick solution to support farmers or traders, you might want to stick to indirect participation. That then gives you leeway to grow and also to navigate behind, let another party navigate their laws while you're actually focusing on the solution. Direct participation also means you, there's uh, stringent technology requirements. Nobody will allow you to join their switch if your technology is not at par, if your cyber security is low, if you don't have mechanisms to manage fraud, etc. So then at least the direct in participation makes sense. There's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, which is aligned to ISO standards, and mostly this touch on your KYC requirements, not your client. They will specify what sort of best data you need to collect to identify a, a customer to be able to execute a transaction. Now, this changes from country to country, but they maintain the, the initial standards set by ISO to be able to make sure you are meeting the international standards. And then look at the economic model. Why is the economic model important? The economic model covers things like customer fees, interparty fees, settlement costs, etc. Now, if a payment system is not for loss making, it means someone like central bank is subsidizing the cost. And it also means the solutions that you layer on top of that payment system will be cheap and therefore affordable to the financial inclusion solution. But in most cases, you also find it's a set of uh, bankers or uh, mobile money operators who come in. They will invest in the switch because they're expecting a profit. But they will sit down and agree on the best minimum charges they need to put in place so that if I, Halila, is coming on board with my app that is supporting health insurance for patients, I'm able to know what, what fee will be deducted that will go to this party, that party, etc., and what is my profit margin. So it's critical to familiarize what's going on in the market and how you price your product and what other costs you need to pay. Lastly, there's licensing requirements. So what does it take for you to be a deposit uh, taking uh, circle or not? What does it mean for you to be a mobile money operator or to be an e-money issuer? or also to be part of the uh, all the components I've discussed. So this, again, are typically outlined in the Payment Systems Act, but you will find uh, notoriously also some of the uh, Communications Act also govern what the mobile operators can do. So they need to navigate between the different laws that exist in a country. So as you prepare your solution, because uh, the base of the pyramid, as we saw earlier, they, they don't typically go to a bank. They will probably go to a, a mobile money operator. They will go to a circle. As you've seen, one of my uh, colleagues is going to present on the circles. They will go to a post bank. They will go to a microfinance institution. Now, mobile money operators uh, fall, uh, part of the e-money issuance is uh, under the Payment Systems Act. Part of e-money issuance is affected by cyber security laws and also the competition authority and also consumer protectionism act but at the same time mobile money operators as an entity in most countries they fall under telecommunications authority so you have potential conflicts and you need to know what each what each authority is responsible for and where do you fit even when you're designing your solution and who you should target Post banks, uh, traditionally across uh, Africa, they fall under national treasury. Most people assume it falls under the central bank, it doesn't. And the reason it falls under national treasury is uh, the national treasury has created tax waivers to make the services of post bank affordable. And that is why in most countries, uh, post banks you'll find they've penetrated almost the entire country and their costs are really low. But just like mobile money operators, so they are partly um, 
they participated by the National Treasury, but they also fall under Telecommunications Authority because of the communications aspect of the uh, telepost uh, network. So that's an interesting that thing that you need to note. But even as you work on this and you work on interoperability, you want to move money from a post bank to a mobile uh, wallet to a bank wallet, you have to know what it means for the charges and the benefits and incentives that your end users will get. Circles, again, in most countries also fall under separate regulatory body. Sometimes uh, they fall under micro but most countries have actually spinned out a union that typically works with the, with the circles, as well as microfinance institutions. Almost half the countries in Africa have spinned out a separate umbrella body to govern the microfinance finance institution. And they have uh, outlined specifically what are the rules for deposit taking and then deposit taking uh, MFIs as well as uh, deposit taking and deposit taking uh, circles. And they've also created tiers in terms of the investment that these organizations have taken in place. Now, when you know this and you know which type of services you are, you are, you are targeted customer are intending to access, it's then easy for you to decide, am I going to pitch my app to work with the post bank, with the mobile operator, with the microfinance institutions, or do I want a solution that cuts across all this to give my users flexibility? And what, what, cost, what is the cost of that flexibility and can my users afford it if they can't afford it to pay? So those are critical uh, reminders. Interesting coming uh, developments, crowdfunding. Ghana has put in place a crowdfunding um, policy. This because of huge demand on uh, crowdfunding and I think it was fast tracked with COVID. People kept uh, putting out requests for money and uh, social payments, etc. So there was need to regulate the sector. A lot of countries are in the process of coming up with fintech regulations, uh, which uh, may or may not touch on the micro lending. The reason central banks do not really delve into micro lending, regulating it easily, is because central banks are mandated to work with systemically important systems, which if they crash, a whole economy comes down. And the micro lending doesn't fall in that category because if you look at the overall percentage of what it contributes to the economy, it's a tiny percentage. And so the, the regulator is faced with the hard question of do I really need to step in, even though people are complaining about loan sharks and all that. Now you have uh, microinsurance. Uh, countries like Kenya are already beginning to look at insertech um, uh, legislation framework because uh, this is becoming a key issue in health sector where you have microinsurance as well as the other sectors like agriculture where you have uh, crop insurance in case of crop failure. And then uh, data protection. This one is actually very challenging. It cuts across all policies. Each, each uh, policy act you come across, you'll find the bits and components of data protection. But at the same time, uh, African governments have started realizing the importance of data protection and most countries are spinning it out as a standalone uh, act. So you need to pay attention. What is also a, a strength that is coming out is data nationalization, where the bulk of nations say, OK, I don't want data to leave my soil. It needs to be closed in India. It needs to be closed in uh, Uganda, in Ethiopia, etc. What does that mean when you're designing your solution and you're doing cloud computing? It impacts how you design the solution and what sets of data you can hold and store and where you store it and for what purpose and for how long. And then uh, credit bureaus, uh, some form of regulation is coming here, driven largely by digital microlending because they were busy listing even uh, defaulters for as low as $10. So suddenly a country that had only 10,000 defaulters over a period of two years suddenly have 5 million defaulters and all defaulters are defaulting say $10. It doesn't make sense. So that forced uh, some of the regulators to put in measures about who can be listed in the Credit Reference Bureau. So I won't delve a lot into this because my colleague is going to talk about COVID. What I just wanted to point out is pre-COVID, financial inclusion was core. During and post-COVID, it's still even more reinforced. Now, uh, pre-COVID, the steps were the same. Uh, look at the regulation framework, human-centered design, what's your technology roadmap, 
what's your part to scale, redress, etc. Post COVID, what is coming out and uh, it's interesting is uh, some temporary and permanent regulations have been enacted to sub, uh, either waive transaction fees for the base of the pyramid or to reduce the cost. Now it's an opportunity to lock those down to be able to, to give solutions. There are a lot of opportunities around um, uh, people want to give catalytic grants, donors are keen on interest-free loans to the base of the pyramid. So can you create a stimulus package for micro retail traders and be able to allow them to access loans without complicating uh, their life? More emphasis on solutions in health and education because of online learning. And also in health, what, what does a form of health insurance look, even issues like COVID and other diseases that have been ignored for the longest time, like the diabetes and other non-communicable disease, uh, diseases. But overall, uh, it has reinforced more and more the need to know economic inclusion, social inclusion and financial inclusion goes hand in hand. You cannot put technology in the hands of a farmer when the farmer is not producing what will they use the technology for? They can't sell because there's no crop. You cannot uh, put a technology in the hands of a trader because the trader does not have stock, does not have capital. And yet you, are, you, you have a, a tool like uh, Glovo or uh, Jumia telling them like, you can sell your goods online, but they have no goods to sell. So how then do you work on an ecosystem approach that supports uh, economic inclusion, social inclusion, you know, the danger with technology, it's designed by man. Uh, one of the colleagues mentioned artificial intelligence learning. They're all designed by man. <laughs> now, whether it's man or woman, they have biases. I can put my biases in how I design a technology algorithm. And it can, without knowing, I can actually cause discrimination. I think we've seen examples in China where you have CCTV that can't recognize dark skin because you don't fit that profile of the person. Uh, some, some biometric solutions are also discriminatory. If you don't have uh, fingers and a solution requires fingerprints, does that mean I can't access financial inclusion? So all becomes critical and it has even become more critical with the COVID, uh, during the COVID and post-COVID era. So I'll stop there and hand back to the coordinator. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kalila. Thanks, Kalila. They were you know, really great insights. Uh, you talked about the different regulations. And I really liked about what you were talking about the artificial intelligence. See, a machine can be as intelligent how you train it. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's all about the trainer who trains it. And you rightly said, you know, financial inclusion also needs economic inclusion. So that's a very good, uh, you know, point that you have highlighted. We all agree, you know, COVID has been a big challenge for us. And you know, I really want to thank uh, uh, you know African Development Bank uh, helping uh, Development uh, Banking Group to ensuring sustained efforts and efforts towards financial inclusion. Uh, rightly, like uh, you have, uh, I can say you have highlighted two points. One of the infrastructure point. Obviously, I'm not going to touch upon the regulations, and you know, because that has to be some some that has to be defined by the. The, the, the central authority or the government. But two areas where we are going to cover today is, you know, uh, how the infrastructure cost can be shared, which I think uh, my colleague Amy will be covering that. And he will he will he will share his live experience, how he, you know, he and his team are addressing that challenge of infrastructure, uh, you know, reducing the cost of operation cost of, uh, you know, um, coming out with a financial inclusion uh, solution so that Amy will be uh, talking about moreover you know uh, you know we know that uh, 2020 2021 have been a very very tough year for all of us at multiple levels like my colleague uh, Kalila talked about the economic inclusion we know that the pandemic has literally stalled and delayed all the good work that were initiated towards French inclusion uh, yes it has bring a challenge you know it has bring a challenge but uh, uh, when, whenever there is a challenge thrown to us, you know, there is a new normal which comes out. Okay, so yes, uh, COVID has given us a new challenge. Uh, we have to come out with a solution how to address that. How, you know, that's why I'm talking about, uh, we used to, uh, I will say pre-COVID, we used to talk about financial inclusion. Post-COVID, I will talk about digital financial inclusion. Because, you know, earlier the 
customers used to come to the bank now we have to ensure that how the banking reaches out to the customer so you know i would like to now uh, shift the focus on shion who will be uh, who will try to who will help us to understand the measures that have been taken during the pandemic towards financial inclusion he has been uh, part of the strategic uh, team who manages financial inclusion in nigeria and what is the road ahead what are the challenges and what are the road ahead and what are the measures uh, you know we have you know the banks are taking the financial institutions are taking to alleviate the pain uh, the due to the loss of work pay livelihood you know what i said kalila mentioned um, economic inclusion how we can uh, reduce that pain of our fellow uh, uh, you know uh, people in africa and most important importantly how technology uh, enabling financial inclusion which i talked about digital financial inclusion will help to address these areas um, you know uh, so over to you sion you know i will uh, we'll be happy to hear something uh, you know more about you on the challenges of covid and post covid what we can do to uh, you know digitally fast track the financial inclusion so thanks kalila again over to you sion thanks a lot Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Gopta. Thank you, Kalila, uh, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, you really touch um, a lot of, um, you know, my touch, um, you know, a lot of points that have made my job very, very easy. Uh, you talk uh, from the regulatory uh, uh, point of view. I uh, will be talking more uh, from a, uh, a, a stakeholder, man. Like, um, a, a, I mean, a stakeholder in terms of a player in the in the financial space um, of um, Nigeria, particularly. Uh, so on this, on this note, I want to say big thanks to all our audience um, across the Africa and across, uh, across the globe uh, for joining. We thank you for your time and uh, thanks for uh, staying tuned and also to the uh, Bonfish team uh, for putting up this uh, together. Um, so I will start by saying, uh, why is this session very important to us? Um, as Kalida has said, um, and the COPTA has also uh, collaborated, um, the, the year 2020 uh, was a very tough year uh, for everyone across the globe, uh, particularly in Africa, where we have the largest uh, population of, uh, of the unbanked, uh, you know, in the world. And also we have um, a lot of Africa that are living um, slightly and within the poverty line. And um, um, by prediction that he said that uh, above 20 million Africans can be um, thrown back into the poverty cycle just because of the uh in part of the COVID-19 pandemic and then uh, that is why um as Kalida has, as Kalida has really said um you can't be talking about uh, financial inclusion if there's no economic empowerment uh so these the two must go hand in hand so what are we going to be doing now with COVID and even as uh, we are still looking at uh, uh COVID the uh, financial and economic part, impact of COVID-19 especially on the bottom of the pyramid uh to whom financial inclusion are quite important uh, so I will start uh, by looking at a uh, few challenges that uh, all of us uh, were aware of as regards uh, what COVID-19 has done. We know uh, right now there's a lot of adjustment in terms of how we live our life, in terms of interaction between people, between business, and what we have and what, and what have you. And also there's a reduced physical interaction. You can't go, uh, there are places that you can't go without uh, you know, getting some uh, uh, clearance. And this has also reduced with, uh, the number of uh, working time, especially for the micro, um, you know, for the micro businesses, which are the largest proportion of the unbanked population, many of them are still struggling uh, to come back to business because during the COVID-19, they are, of course, they, the government they did their best in terms of trying to uh, uh, reduce the impact of uh, the COVID-19, but uh, uh, by and large, a lot of intervention uh, had little impact in terms of economic relief uh, for the micro and the low income. Uh, vulnerable group that um, you know that are now struggling to come back to business, and for this reason, there's always uh, you know there's now issue with uh, liquidity in terms of cash flow. Their cash flow, a lot of cash flow has been disrupted, and this has also affected uh, um, you know banks in terms of portfolio uh, quality. And this, well, these are some of the things I will be sharing as we go home. So, um, can I get through um, the next slides? Um, uh, so, um, what are the goods? There are, there are some, um, you know, COVID-19 has brought to, has brought to us some uh, positive impacts, especially in terms of financial inclusion and the uh, digital uh, digitization of financial of, of financial um, products and services. Uh, because of the restriction here and there, people are now, you know, increasing their usage of digital channel 
um, in terms of uh, doing businesses and also making payments. And that was actually why we have uh, the kind of growth Africa recorded in terms of mobile money, um, uh, mobile money uh, performance in 2020, uh, which um, we will also be seeing as we go as we go home. Um, also, we have a new product uh, penetration in terms of uh, on the digital space. Um, we have a lot of products in terms of digital lending, particularly that are that have been using to that have been used to actually uh, reach out uh, to the low income and bank population. But we look at whether this actually impacted um, this uh, the, this particular segment of our society as we go on this presentation. Uh, so I'll talk about a few of the bad sides of COVID nineteen uh, pandemic impact. Uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, a few, I mean, a lot of uh, you know people that lost their jobs. Uh, across Africa, it's the bank, the bank worker, uh, a quite number of people who lost their job because uh, bank reduced their number of branch expansion. And um, also, we, as I've talked before, we have low, we have a low, low, low quality of portfolio. And also, we are having a lot of people now suffering with, uh, uh, you know, hunger and poverty and risk of even increasing the poverty line and poverty, uh, poverty level in Africa. And um, of course, one of the areas where this has really impacted national uh, Industry is the area of uh, saving mobilization. Um, as it does. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. You can, you can uh, continue. Okay. okay, thank you. So, as you, another aspect that is not too good is the increase in terms of transactional cost. Uh, because people now resort to agent, agent banking, and mobile money agent to carry out transaction, and because there's no too much of a uh, uh, support uh, in terms of um, um, liquidity support uh, from the banks and the uh, the uh, uh, the mainstream financial service provider, you know, agents are having issue with liquidity, so they tend to make do to make the best use of whatever fund they have, and that actually increases. Uh, the cost of uh, transaction in terms of the RDP, which has which Kalija has, has actually talked about. Uh, so the most ugly part of it is because we have now we have an issue with insecurity and the fraud, in, you know, increase in fraud in terms of uh, we have seen cases in Africa, especially in Nigeria, where people uh, we have access to um, somebody, I mean, someone else um, ATM card and go to an agent to withdraw money. That has that has actually become a, a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, concern. As regards this particular uh, aspect of digitalization, so I will say, let's move to the next, next slide quickly. Um, so I want to I want to share with us also some key financial inclusion uh, data, uh, which can be of interest to us. But as, as I've said before, I'll be talking as a player in terms of uh, a, 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 a player in the financial industry. I'm not a regulator, so I'm a business person. I want to look at let's look at the figure and look at these business opportunities and market opportunities that also uh you know available that can be uh, that can be leveraged on as we continue to drive digital and financial inclusion in africa so uh look at this data we have about 50 percent of africa uh adults that are still on bank this is according to world bank report and that is about 674 million adult population in africa in nigeria for example we have about 40 million nigerians that are still on bank and we combine the ratio of bank with uh, under seven Nigeria, we'll be looking at about 70 percent uh, that are yet to be that are still uh, yet to be truly uh, served in terms of financial um, um, services. Also, in Africa, in Nigeria, also we have a lot of SME and that are still not uh, fully served. We have about 50 percent of SME in Nigeria, and in Nigeria, for example, uh, over 70 percent of Nigerian uh, economy are being are being generated. I uh, mean, that being controlled by the MSME uh, in particular. And that's actually an interesting goal for, for, for uh, uh, players in the industry to actually create products that can maximize the opportunity. And also, in Africa, also, uh, there's, there's a continuous increase in terms of uh, the number of uh, people that are, that are having access to mobile internet. As at the end of 2019, we have over, over 272 million people already on the internet. And as by last year, this, are, this has increased. And this is projected to be around about, about 475 to 500 million by the year 2025. That's actually created a market opportunity for digitization of uh, products and services, at least to read the bank. OK, so uh, quickly, can we move to the next slide um, because of time? So um, now, looking at how we can use the uh, 
digital technology to uh, to drive financial inclusion in Africa. I want to take a, a case study of mobile, mobile money, which Kalija has also spoken about. Uh, for example, one of the greatest um, drivers of financial inclusion as we speak in Africa now is the mobile and the mobile money and the banking services. And in, in year 2020, we globally we have uh, over 1.2. Uh, billion registered uh, mobile accounts, in terms of wallet account that was that was opened by mobile money agent, which is quite a, a number. And um, in Africa, uh, we have about almost 100 million that was op that was uh, that was opened in terms of a mobile account that was opened in Africa in 2020, just in one year. And uh, look at the 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 value in terms of the monetary value of the transaction that were carried out uh, on mobile money in in, in in the world. We have about two billion. Um, in the world, and Africa contributed over 40 percent of this transaction value. And you look at Nigeria, let's take Nigeria for example. Uh, the, the digital transaction value in Nigeria for last year was in excess of a, was over 400 billion dollars. That was a lot of money, and we have a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, market players like OP, um, that like uh, money points that are actually doing over 1.5 billion monthly uh, uh, value that's of transaction on the on the um, on on, on e-payment and the uh, you know mobile money services in Nigeria, which is quite um, um you know uh, uh, significant to say to say the least. And uh, we also have some other uh, information that I would like to share. Um, over three hundred million um mobile 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 money mobile money active accounts we had in last year. You know one of the challenges that also reduced or that also impacted financial inclusion to bank led model. Is the issue of um, domacy, domacy accounts. You know, we have a lot of banks when you open accounts, people don't get to service because of three factor like uh, not, not being relevant to me or no accessibility in terms of uh, follow up and bringing the no buy money services into the space now because this is a more closer uh, touch point to the customers. You can see that the level of activity are. Are coming, you know, are, are, are coming to uh, to become more more better uh, in that aspect. So um, I will move for, I move to the next slide because of uh, our time. But we want to make it to be more interactive so that we can also have time to also uh, hear from our listener and our audience across the globe. So um, quickly, have a look at the impact and the uh, the journey so far in terms of where we are. In, uh, in Africa, in terms of uh, uh, digital, digitization and financial inclusion, what should we be doing? What should we be looking at at this point in time? Okay, even though we have recorded a lot of progress in terms of uh, what the agent and money, uh, agent banking and money, uh, mobile money services are able to achieve in, uh, in financial inclusion or digital financial inclusion, there are still a lot of gaps because by research, we could see that uh, most of the activity that are still being done via the mobile money agents are people that are previously have bank accounts before or they have had they have had one or two form of financial service interaction before they are not totally like excluded people so in the recent uh they are still a lot of um uh, hard to reach uh, target market that are still left in the both in the big banking in banking space and the digital financial space and this, are the, this, are, this should be where, where our focus should be as we move forward towards driving financial inclusion and so ensure that we also achieve economic empowerment as um, rightly said by the, uh, by the previous speaker, uh, Kalila. So um, what should be our focus? Our focus right now is to ensure that we promote acceptability and accessibility of mobile financial technology. Because right now we have seen that the way to go is actually Digital financial inclusion, because based on the impact of COVID nineteen, you can see that the bank has adjust, has adjusted uh, their operation, and they also have an issue with liquidity. So the, the expansion in terms of branch opening uh, for banks cannot be as it to be because of the impact of COVID nineteen pandemic. And most people in Africa, because of the fact that we have a lot of huge uh, population, we have a lot of people that are also coming into uh, the usage of uh, internet services and most of these youth, youth, youth population, they are used to, uh, you know, engaging uh, with their phone. So the issue of going to bank to go and transact are not really are not really attractive to them anymore. So the road and the way is digital financial inclusion. However, 
we must address the key focus or the key causes of exclusion, which has to do with rich, as we are as, as, as said by the Africa. The rich in terms of a lot of um, places in Africa are not totally covered in terms of internet accessibility. And where it's covered, the cost of internet, internet access is still a bit of concern with some of these, uh, our target markets, which are the lower, uh, which are the low income uh, category, these vulnerable people. So also, we look at the time, as Kalida has said, in, in, in the vulnerable people, the low income people, when they want to, uh, when they want to put in their money in terms of uh, carrying out the transaction, they want it now, 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 because all their cover, all their, all their, um, all their pennies really can't be there. So we also have to address the issue of speed and also in terms of cost also, because as I noted earlier, one of, one area where digital financial, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, we like the great digital financial inclusion are not addressed is the, is the aspect of affordability. Okay, so bringing this together, we look at how to move forward by addressing the issue of the target market, which are the people, the product, the process, which is policy and regulation, and also in terms of collaboration, as said by Kalija, uh, a lot of the things for, for a lot of interoperability between players in the ecosystem. So, can we move to the next slide? Um, First of our time. So, in, to put it in the, uh, in the in the broader perspective, when I talk about the market, the first thing that we need to be focusing on as players, either as a regulator or as as a business player in the industry or as a social provider, is to increase awareness and also increase uh, the literacy the literacy level of the target market. As Riley said by Kalida, the last speaker, she said that financial inclusion is not for the rich, and that is what is obvious, obvious fact. Financial inclusion are not meant for people that are already uh, financially or well served in terms of you know, uh, usage and also in terms of um, uh, liquidity. And what, what, what are you? And for people that are having resentment in terms of either going to bank to do transaction or even adopting the option of using digital channels to carry out transactions. These are people that are still keeping their money inside their assets. And this, uh, uh, this largest proportion in, in Africa are still very, very large. For example, in Nigeria, we have a lot of people that rather, 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 rather than put their money in the bank, they put their money with their, um, with their institution, or we call it a larger. And these are posing a lot of risk, most systemic risk, risk, even to the economy. Because the banking, I mean, the financial uh, sector that also has impact in driving GDP cannot really um, move at the pace it ought, to, it ought to have moved when we have a lot of money that are still uh, outside uh, the financial space. And this, this is because of one, as you have, have said, the financial literacy in terms of their perception to, towards uh, digital channels, even mobile technology. So we need to increase, we need to invest a lot Across board, across board, across all um, the parties, across all the stakeholders in the space, we need to increase our engagement and also our capacity building for the target market in terms of using every means to bring them into accept, into into uh, into accepting and also embracing both mobile technology and digital financial uh, service because that's actually the way to go to reach the audience. And also, we look at the segmentation. Uh, in Africa, uh, there's still a bit of um, disparity in terms of um, gender, both in terms of male-female ratio, in terms of uh, um, level of uh, financial inclusion. And the ratio, the ratio is killed against the female gender. But that has also been established that we have a lot of uh, female entrepreneurs in Africa that are contributing in a lot of ways. So both uh the gdp and also to society and community development because the role of women is quite uh you know um it's quite great in terms of building a sustainable society and, a, and an economy at large so we have to divide products in, as we go towards ensuring that we move in this digital financial digital uh financial inclusion what to what what to what to, what to div uh, divide products that can address the specific needs and expectations of the female gender. And what are their needs? It's kind of, you know that female, like, um, they have emotional attachment uh, towards their children, they have emotional attachment towards their family, 
there will be which I touch me to the health, there will be which I touch me even uh, towards uh, their future. So we can create products in terms of target saving, in terms of education as said by Kalida that can help them take care of their children, education, and make this to be in a digital form and take it away from the traditional approach to digital approach. So we must address this of uh, segmentation as regards developing products that can help us to increase uh, women empowerment and uh, financial inclusion. Uh, I think uh, we are having some challenge with his internet. Okay, we were talking about the challenges with internet in reaching out to our customers. Okay, so we can see if we can face, you know, that's, you know, that's one of the challenge that, um, you know, why, huh? you know, yes, Sion is back. Yes, Sion. Okay. Oh, sorry. Where did you, uh, where did I stop? Uh, you know, uh, it's okay. You can continue. I think uh, uh, you were about to finish. So, so you can finish okay. it up. Right up. Yeah. So we need to address the issue of um, enlightenment and literacy uh, for the advanced population and ensure that we increase the level of adoption and acceptance of uh, mobile technology, which is actually the basis for driving digital financial inclusion. And also the issue of confidence must also be addressed. They need an approach that, that is close to them. Yeah, Sion, Sion, you're still there? I think. Okay, so yes. that's yes. yeah. I think that's a challenge we were talking about uh, the connectivity. So we can see, you know. Uh, uh, so I'd like to, uh, you know, thanks, Sion, for all your insights. I'm just winding up, Sion. Thanks, thanks a lot for your insights. Okay. And uh, cl clearly, we know that technology is playing a vital role in benefiting individuals and businesses. And uh, and uh, at this point, you know, you know, you know, I want to highlight few things which uh, uh, you know, Sean was talking about the technology, you know, the challenge of internet connectivity. And actually, you know, we were uh, we were able to see what happened. You know, the, the connectivity broke when Sean was giving his presentation. So, you know, there was an interesting use case, which I want to share with you, uh, you know, uh, everyone. Okay. So during, uh, you know, we are, we were working with a very, you know, one of the largest microfinance in uh, Nigeria where Sion belongs to. Okay. And, uh, you know, and we are very proud to say that during the pandemic period or during the pandemic period, when, you know, people were not coming out of the houses to do the banking during that pandemic period, we have, you know, we were able to successfully serve over 5 million uh, customers of that microfinance and they have an agent network of more than 5,000 agents which were, which, which were delivering banking services to their customers on the doorstep doorstep and you know you know you will be surprised that even during the pandemic period we were able to uh, you know touch over 300,000 transactions per day so that's so that's how the technology enabled banking services during the pandemic when you know people were inside their house but the technology enabled that people people you know get their banking services they were able to pay the bill payments they were able to transfer money to their you know uh, you know loved and dear ones they were able to repay their loans in fact uh, they were also able to access loan you know during this pandemic period and on the internet connectivity, you know, and we are also happy to share that, you know, we enable both online and offline mode of uh, transaction. So during the online, if the connectivity is there, you know, that transaction was happening real time online. And when the transaction was not happening, when the internet was not proper, you know, the agents were able to perform transaction offline. And whenever they got to a good network connection or, you know, we were connected to a better network, the whole transaction was posted to the server. So that's one area, you know, where technology is helping financial, uh, you know, institutions in this pandemic. And, you know, uh, before that, uh, we would love to have one small poll before we move to our third panelist, Mr. Amy. And I'm sure that Amy is going to share you a very, very, and that's my favorite topic, which is a shared infrastructure. And, you know, we'll, we should, we will wait for Amy to share his insights. Before that, uh, we will do a small poll to, you know, get understanding, you know, how things are moving in the financial inclusion landscape in your uh, areas. Uh, Niranjan. Yeah, thank you, Kunal. So uh, everyone will be able to sort of see the poll on their screen. So if I can request you to, you know, uh, 
submit your responses yeah we'll give about uh, 10 seconds uh, before we share So we have got uh, good questions. Uh, uh, you know, Khalila, there are some questions for you. Maybe, you know, once we finish with Amy, you know, Ramsey has some question for you. Uh, in even, you know, Kingsley has some questions. So we will, I'll post those questions to you once we uh, hear Amy out. Yeah. So we've got a few responses. So let's, let's take it up uh, later, Krinal. I mean, yes. uh, so we'll publish it. Yeah. Okay, great. So we are done with the polls. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So let me, you know, uh, you know, bring uh, Amy now. Uh, we have been talking about more about technology so much. Okay, so one of the my favorite topic, uh, you know, who is my 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 dear friend, my colleague, Amy is going to talk about. He is uh, he is one of the specialists who is you know uh, who is spearheading that uh, uh, manage uh, you know, uh, the shared IT infrastructure for SACOs. Okay, and it will be interesting to learn, you know, the yeah. question posted in the you know chat also how the infrastructure challenges are addressed. You know, Amy will give you a, another uh, dimension, um, another angle. You know how infrastructure challenges have been addressed. You know, and he's spreading, uh, he's spreading that uh, you know initiative. So over to you, uh, Amy. Uh, we we are eager to hear about your initiatives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Krinal. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, IT shared service as a solution, strategy, and way forward for uh, to accelerate financial inclusion. So, uh, the first question is: uh, What are the what do we mean by hosted shared services models? We talk about how are they critical. And uh, particularly for the context of Rwanda and what, to, what will be next, what will be next. So first of all, put it simple, uh, hosted shared services entails infrastructure, uh, technologies that can be accessed virtually, regularly, without any problem by more than one um, financial institution. In Rwanda now, we are trying to bring together 10 financial institutions, and you will see how that is working. And uh, what's, what are the benefits? Everything that can be benefited, that a, a micro, a financial institution can benefit from IT is benefited. They benefit equally from different modules, Securely, security, and many, many other things. They, they have each one of them separate data backup on a regular basis, a data recovery storage at first and second level, even distant one. So those IT infrastructures can be acquired uh, by, by circles put, put together, but uh, that, uh, that is the theory for financial reasons that I will be showing. And uh, currently, uh, circles are facilitating funding, are benefiting funding to, to have them. So in Rwanda particularly, we have uh, the Access to Finance Rwanda, which is an organization that is, uh, that is providing funds to support the circle. And the Rwandan Association of Microfinances in Rwanda, uh, that is serving as bridge uh, between the access to finance Rwanda and those circles. So the Association of Microfinance in Rwanda is an umbrella, so hence facilitator of that initiative and definitely uh, organ organizer. So um, particularly for Rwanda, let me tell you, uh, why is this concept of IT share service uh, gaining uh, wider, a wide audience uh, among stakeholders in Rwanda from policy decision makers and, uh, and, you know, different stakeholders. You know, Rwanda is a very particular country. Uh, we all Rwanda, 
Each one of us has heard about Rwanda from different perspectives. We have a very sad history uh, that we are trying to, to turn into, you know, a different experience. We want to develop this country. We, we are known for that history, for that sad history. But interestingly, Rwanda is becoming a, a champion in many areas uh, in social development. Rwanda is becoming champion uh, simply become, because Rwanda understands that uh, it is always good to tap into uh, tradition to solve uh, most of our uh, social problems. We have the concept like Ubudehe. Uh, Ubudehe is something, is a traditional concept, cultural concept, where people in the village come together to solve a, a community problem. It can be a road, it can be a construction of a school, it can be, uh, you know, uh, repairing a bridge with the contribution of the government. We have the Mutuel de Santé. The Rwanda is one of global challenges to prove that global healthcare access is possible. In Rwanda, we know that from three US dollar to seven US dollar, everyone can have access to decent healthcare. People are accepted up to the uh, to the uh, hospital King Faisal, which is the best hospital in Rwanda. So we are used to solving problem by through mutual solution. So you understand that uh, for Rwanda to describe, to receive the receptivity, I shared service, it was very quick. So I really anticipate that very soon, Rwanda will champion even IT shared service uh, applications in Rwanda. So we expect them, we expect IT shared service to, uh, to, to for SACOs who will participate, uh, they will be expected to pay a very minimum contribution, sometimes even after a one year grace period and benefit from, uh, from IT tech from systems that are well equipped with fraud monitoring and detection tools, plus anti money laundering, counter financing, terrorism system that will be compliant to update the regulatory reporting systems, uh, that will be meeting cyber security standards. Again, thank you very much to my, my previous colleagues for for mentioning COVID as a, as a new element that brought a new page. So these IT shared service, they will be with open slots to integrate platforms for agent networks and other digital financial solution in the framework of inclusive, instant and interoperable payment systems. We understand how this will be very, very key uh, where at the moment, the world is, is going uh, with the maximum digital uh, service provision, particularly in the context of COVID. So when in Rwanda, these are key figures. You know, we have our traditional historical experience, but we have our economical situation uh, what do we know about Rwanda? What do we know uh, from this market that really push us to go for uh, IT shared service? We know from the FinScope uh, 2020 that uh, the informal uh, financial services who still attract between 90 and uh, from 33 to 90, respectively in Kigali and rural areas and uh, a high portion of the money uh, remain in uh, informal sick, informal secret. So, and that money, uh, eighty percent is from women. So, we have now uh, forty-nine percent uh, of women who can still access to. Uh, don't know who can still be, uh, who can still access access to former savings. So, in that situation, the the soldiers on the battlefield we could count on are these circles and microfinances and, uh, in rural 
areas. Uh, unfortunately, they are they are not uh, they are not sufficiently empowered to onboard and uh, fulfill their mission to serve effectively, sustainably uh, the underprivileged segment of the market, most pre present in rural uh, er in rural areas. By looking at them and by 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 what is happening from different reports, we can see that uh, those circles and, MF and uh, microfinances uh, still have uh, low operational and financial pe performance. They have poor reporting. They have opacity and fraud. And those issues remain a serious subject uh, of concern to the Rwandan government starting from through the regulator. So they they also have, they also remain with financial, limited financial capacity to acquire their own infrastructure. And even those who have tried remain with, uh, uh, with uh, staff with limited skills to maintain them, to still, uh, to keep using them as it should. So financially speaking, let us look at, uh, uh, I have a poll here of, uh, six microfinances. It's very interesting. It's very important to see that uh, uh, put together, they have 43% of the femur in the clientele. Okay. Of clients, they have 35% with the customer base that is below, that is maximum 35. This is very important for youth uh, attraction and employment. Youth uh, inclusivity and female inclu inclusivity in the financial system. So we have their expenses annually. These are recent figures until uh, end 2020. Uh, they are operate, they are operations Sorry, um, their operations, accumulation, operation, accumulated operation expenses can go up to almost 900,000 900, a year. And we can see what they were, they have been able to spend in the, in the IT infrastructure. Among them, we have two that didn't spend anything because simply they don't have IT. That's what it means. Can you see? They don't have IT. And please know that these institution, they've been serving from between five years to go up to 30 years. We have a microfinance here with more than 30 years in the market, but you can see what they have, what they can spend to sustain, to support IT, acquire and sustain IT. So interestingly, I have commercial banks. I have just selected one bank in Rwanda with, with less, with minor spending. The, the bank number two, as you can see, appear to be with uh, uh, 1.5 million. And that is for the IT cost only. That is for the IT costly, the IT, yeah, that is for IT expenses. And you can see that accumulation of operation expenses from six microfinance is uh, slightly um, a half of one, one bank expenses in IT only. Can you see it? We have two microfinance who have never attempted anything so far in terms of uh, IT. So I personally recall, I've been in two financial institutions. I've been in microfinance that, uh, that it's, it's one of leading. It actually do have two, uh, two million US dollar capital. And I recall that uh, we had to benefit uh, 
uh, from uh, from five 500k US dollar from MasterCard simply to develop alternative channels. So I have another case where we have been deploying um, this this uh, mobile network, uh, this mobile agent network for 20. Then and we had to benefit a grant from uh, the access to finance grant. So those are the costs. We have a, a cost issue. We have a financial capacity issue to just to make a case of to make a case of support to go for uh, IT shared service. But uh, it's not only that. We have uh, another reason. The customer we are serving are very important, and they are. We always repeat that they are poor. Yes, they are poor, but they are saving local and global economies. By taking this example, you can see them. They are, they are people that I know very well, and they are participating in a, through a, a cooperative asopte in the northern province of Rwanda. They are busy producing tea, and one of the best tea you can have in Rwanda. Twice, they have to get payments from the leaves they have produced and supplied. So we need to keep their time. From that experience, I think we have more than one reason to go for uh, IT shared platforms. And uh, these people deserve respect. These people deserve honor. We should give them the best we can give as actors in the financial sector. And uh, I think uh, the IT share service will be a powerful tool to serve them effectively, efficiently, and accelerate, maximize our speed uh, for a complete financial inclusion. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much. You know, we have got, uh, you know, I have got personal responses from participants, uh, you know, who, you know, it's uh, they're impressed with uh, the government of, you know, government of Rwanda. Uh, you know, I just want to correct a uh, few people. It's not Uganda, it's Rwanda. So the initiative of government of Rwanda uh, to, you know, do this initiative. And also we have got feedback about uh, Kalila and Sion. Uh, it's a very valuable insights which Sean has shared on the COVID and the category or how they have categorized uh, uh, addressing the challenges that have been you know posed by the pandemic. And Khalila, you have we have questions for you as well. You know, people want to understand, you know, how uh, you know uh, you know things goes. So, Emmy, uh, uh, do you want to finish or you are, you are done with that? Uh, yeah, the way forward. The way forward, I think we have already started, but we still need to learn. Rural areas do have more than 300 circles. Now we are starting by 10. The government on the other side is trying some other, some other different from those uh, government uh, circles. So we need funding. We need more funding for this. And we need to keep learning. So we need to connect to or machine learning tools. Uh, uh, I am grateful to my predecessors. They have been described this uh, enough. Uh, we have geodata. Uh, I think uh, we have to know on the, on the regular basis how financial inclusion is progressing, is evolving. For, for more learning, collaboration, and uh, you know, product and services adjustments and foster innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Thanks a lot, Amy. Uh, so uh, just because we have overshoot the timing, I will just pose some questions which has come from the forum. Okay, uh, it, it's for Khalila first. Mm, is there any assistance being given by the UN towards uh, financial inclusion, especially towards poor countries? Or anything African Development Bank can help? You are not audible, uh, uh, Kalila. I said, sorry. I think uh, that's the traditional way of looking at financial inclusion. Because uh, UN and other NGOs are busy trying to design sustainable development 
So when you, have, you find yourself in a situation where you're designing financial inclusion, the trick is in how you unpack the partnership. So if I want to work with farmers, I know WFP is working with over 500 million farmers across Africa. My interest would be to establish a relationship with WFP to access the farmers because the challenge fintechs have is if I'm trying to design a solution, I'm not a farmer and I'm trying to, to find where these farmers are. But if I work with an entity like WFP, I can not only access the farmers, I can link into the value chains they're supporting, like the cereals, the milk, etc., and layer technology to, to facilitate market access. How do I move my produce from the farm gate to the hands of the, of the buyers or to the, to, the, to the factory? And the technology here for smallholder farmers supports aggregation of produce. So the idea is to build an ecosystem that supports value creation. Why should WFP care when a fintech is designing a solution? Why should a fintech care for WFP? Why should a government care about what WFP is doing? So if you bring all these components together, they can work. Now with entities like UN, uh, USID, I don't know, DFID, now they're called something else. It's the value you create. So if I can go in with a compelling proposal I'm going to increase the income of the farmer because I'm going to provide digital micro insurance that will increase the yield of a farmer between uh, three to 10% and income will go up to 35%. They can actually put money on the table to support you. But if you go without a plan and you just say, hey, okay, WFP give me money, they will just tell you I don't have money or the UN entity. So again, it's how you structure partnerships, how you reach out to the communications. And to be honest, financial inclusion actually covers all the SDGs, including SDG number 17, which is partnership for goals. How do you tap into all that? The same thing happens even at FDB. When FDB is reviewing proposals, when they call out for grants or a loan facility for financial inclusion, they will look at what value are you creating, what scale are you reaching, and what's the sustainability and impact. So it's important to know those components uh, as terms of carrying it forward. Because remember, the development sector is struggling on how to move from handles to long-term sustainability. And that is where financial inclusion becomes a critical methodology and an advantage. Great. Uh, so, yeah, you know, Khalila, a, a, a question on this, you know, you know, how, uh, um, you know, African Development Bank is helping the initiatives like what EMI is doing in Rwanda, a shared IT infrastructure. So how is your take as a, an African Development Bank or, you know, IMF or you know, United Nations? So what do you feel, you know, this kind of entity will help support this kind of initiative in countries like, you know, other countries in Africa? So within our facility, we put up request for proposals. Uh, we, we intend to put one probably the next one, maybe end of the year or beginning of 2022. We are still negotiating with our donors. But from the last RFP, we mm. identified two infrastructure. One is in Ethiopia. So we are working with Ethiopia to upgrade the national payment switch. It's switch. And uh, with the, BC, the BC, BCAO, there's BCAO and BIAC. The, the acronyms. So mm -hmm. this is a covering Central Africa region, covering mm -hmm. Cameroon, Congo, etc. They applied for a loan and grant. Mm -hmm. so we awarded them, but we are still in discussion on how that project goes forward because it's quite complex. It's a regional payments uh, system. And then we are also working within the ECOWAS region. We are supporting digital identity. We are supporting uh, uh, regional, sub-regional switches, and now we are looking at a regional switch for the whole of the ECOWAS region. Now, uh, countries like Gambia, etc., have also applied, but we are not the only ones. UNCDF is uh, key. United mm -hmm. Nations uh, Capacity Development Fund, they are very key on uh, uh, infrastructure. They're actually supporting a number of infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. so, to uh, FSD, FSD Africa, FSD for the respective countries. And we also have uh, Gates Foundation recently set up or they're in the process of setting up the African Pan-African Pan Payments Accelerator Network that is geared exactly that to support infrastructure. And the reason they've set this up is at the beginning of the pandemic, most of the African governments uh, were not keen on digital payments infrastructure. They thought it was a nice to have. 
during pandemic when they were caught off guard and they couldn't find a system to transfer social payments, they, they suddenly rushed and suddenly mm -hmm. stopped priority for almost all countries across Africa. But unfortunately, infrastructure projects are very expensive. Mm. So no one single donor can have the resources and hence multiple donors are doing uh, different works. But for anybody who is interested to work, uh, we do publish the RFPs in our website mm -hmm. and look out for it. Our, our pillars cover infrastructure, policy and regulation, and also products and innovation as well as capacity building. And funding is given along those lines. You can apply for loan or you can apply for grant or for a blended finance approach. Okay. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Kalila. Thanks a lot for that insight. Obviously, I think a lot of uh, question was there in how African Development Bank can help. So I think that has clarified a lot of queries that people have. Sion, there is a query for you. Okay. Uh, like you said, that COVID pandemic has caused a lot of financial crisis. Okay. Uh, so, how do we help the situation? Looking at this possibility, you know, you know what, you know what can be done to overcome. You know, banks should not crumble, especially the microfinance. So, uh, what can the help, you know, from the regulators or from any other sources? What you see that what the banks can do to overcome this COVID? You know, is there any, uh, you know, uh, they should digitize or they should, you know, look for some kind of, uh, you know, cutting down the operation costs. So, what is what will your take on? Uh, you know, handling the COVID uh, pandemic, aftermath of COVID pandemic. Okay, okay. Thank you um, for the question. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, basically, um, we, uh, I was speak for my, let's say for my, for my bank, for example, what we did um, um, coming from COVID, the one was to um, uh, test our um, crisis sustainability plan, like to make it robust when the COVID struck to ensure that uh, the stress tests uh, were carried out to see areas uh, where we need to focus on. And, uh, you know, the largest assets of banks still remain the loan portfolio. And COVID-19 has really, uh, to a larger extent, uh, we... I think we are losing... Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can step in with, before he lose him. So, hello. Can, 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 yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, yes, he is back. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, so, yes. So, basically, um, what, you can, what you can be done is to ensure that uh, you guide your um, loan uh, message um, even with all uh, diligence in terms of um, getting uh, interaction, in terms of being connected with your clients, which we did in our bank. The first thing we did when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started is that, like we were close to our customers. We called them, we gave them assurance, we gave them advisory, especially those of them that are not used to, uh, you know, digital um, channel and also they are not used to doing their business digitally. So we have to provide a lot of capacity building to our SME customers to help them move their business, you know, to the digital space, which has impacted on their profitability. And that's also... I think we lost again. Uh, Kalila, you want to pitch in? You want to share your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, it's actually a very good question. And we've seen actually the impact uh, hands-on or uh, mm. <laughs> directly. So not only have the banks been affected, affected, but also the micro lenders like the fintechs, because they used to get the capital financing from banks within a country. Now banks are turning them away. Mm -hmm. And they are actually reaching out to multiple donors to see if there are special funds set up to help uh, institutions recover. What FDB had done, and it's, it's a bit technical, they had issued out a social bond that raised a lot of money. I think it was $3 billion which was supposed to help uh, countries recover. This money, uh, unfortunately, is going through governments. So a government like for Rwanda, for Uganda, et cetera, can pitch to access the fund. And then the fund is helping to support industries like banking sector, the hospitals, the airlines, et cetera, to not go into reception. Now, at, a, at another level, if you can't access that facility, I would advise anyone to look for what recovery mechanisms are being put at the country level because most governments have set up a fund to support the banking sector to cushion against sudden shocks. 
And if not, some of the donor like MasterCard Foundation, Gates Foundation, etc., have also set up special funds that allow uh, the institutions to access. Uh, it's called a special fund, which means you borrow at a lower uh, rate to enable you to support the capital financing for your business. So it's really a tough problem. The demands are really huge because mm -hmm. some of the fintechs were providing interest-free loans uh, mm -hmm. to support uh, businesses to recover. They actually maxed out their capital base in day one. <laughs> Um, they, they were shocked how do I proceed from there yes. but uh, we are still in active in discussion even with the G7 summit to see mm -hmm. possibilities of uh, raising more money great great thanks Kalila and thanks Sion you know I understand you know in fact I you know I work very closely with you I have been interacting with you on multiple forums because I know you know what Adosar and you know you guys Hello? are doing in Nigeria uh, so thanks a lot for your thing. Uh, I, I will. I know there are a lot of questions, you know, people. But you know, I have to take uh, because of the constraint of time. I'll just take one last question for uh, Amy. You know, Amy. Uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of questions for everyone. You know, people want to hear. You know, you questions. But uh, I will be sharing these questions uh, separately with you guys and you know, uh, giving uh, you know answers to everyone one by you know personally on uh, emails and other things. But Amy. Uh, in terms of uh, IT shared services, okay, yeah. how does uh, how you know regulators are helping you? What will be the role of regulators here? Yeah, there is. We have already um, a financial inclusion act in Rwanda, hmm. and uh, the regulator has already uh, addicted uh, a certain number of acts to to facilitate to to. To, to develop, to, to allow to, to, for Rwanda to be with an environment that will be with, uh, with open, with, uh, with, with open loops, uh, ecosystems, development. So okay. we have the switch, we have the switch, we have, uh, we have the electronic uh, clear, clearing house, we have we have a, a committee that is there to ensure that Rwanda uh, does have uh, an efficient and effective and complying secure uh, infrastructure for different stakeholders to connect on corporate uh, interchange and in the framework of, again, uh, inclusive, uh, interoperable uh, financial Payment systems. Great, great. Thanks, Emmy. Thanks, Emmy. Hello. Yeah, you know, I have a very interesting question. You know, let me take this up. You know, uh, how Profinch can help? Uh, you know, bridging this uh, gap for financial inclusion. That's a very interesting question. You now, obviously, what will be our role? You know, we have listening from the experts. We have been listening from Kalila. We are listening from Amy. We are listening from Sion. So, you know, you know what we are bringing on the table. You know, how we can help. You know, people out there. Okay, so, uh, so you know, for the you know benefit of our you know audience, um, we work uh, you know we work we are a global company when we work with over you know fifty from, uh, you know financial institutions globally, and uh, and uh, uh, fifty countries you know not financial institution fifty countries globally we are working more than fifty countries globally, and you know uh, from you know uh, our customers include the top you know big banks you know central banks even the yeah, you know the new banks which are coming up so we work with new banks we work with microfinance we work small tier banks tier, you know big banks even you know ghana commercial bank or mashrek or the barclays or the bank abc atlas Mara. so we work with all kind of, you know banks okay now what we have been done we have been you know why you know i said my favorite topic um, you know is uh, about amy and you know there was a reason because khalila has given us the guidelines and the roadmap how the uh, how African development uh, looks at financial inclusion. So, what uh, there is a you know there is a something which we are working in Kenya currently, uh, something in in line with what Amy is doing, a managed service, you know, a shared IT infrastructure. Okay, so it, it's an IT technology. You know, we, we are using um, we are making a local cloud uh, for uh, you know maybe you know 100 200 microfinances, which will be sharing the complete IT infrastructure. And we will be providing end-to-end -end, uh, digital onboarding, uh, digital wallet, uh, digital loan origination. And the platform will enable and the whole cost will be shared between the 
different tools. It is a you know single instance multi entity technology, so that the deployment is shared, the cost is shared. The more psychos join this uh, you know, network, the cost will reduce drastically. So it's like you you pay as you grow. So that's that's one area because we are working with microfinances. Uh, what we have uh, you know seen that there are uh, there are few microfinances very very big. Maybe you can call it the fincas or the uh, uh, you know the finca or the NMB Tanzania or you may talk about uh, Lapo my, uh, microfinance in Nigeria. Okay, so these are the big microfinances. Okay, so they can afford a million dollar or two million or three million dollar budget to you know uh, set up a big IT infrastructure. But there are there are you know hundreds of microfinances who want that kind of infrastructure, but they are not able to do that. And you know the technology is changing. You know the people, the the, the expectation of the customers, the, the end customer. You know the end customer has access to mobile phones. They have access to Facebook. They have access to Google. They have access to WhatsApp. So their user experience has changed. Okay, I cannot go and give them a solution which is a legacy system. So what we have done, so we came out with a solution where we are working with in line with what Amy is doing. We are working on a shared IT infrastructure where we give them cutting edge technology, cutting edge solution to enable. Enable. I felt one point which I felt um, you know very heartening from Amy is that I want to help those people. You know those are the people that that the tree planters in Rwanda. So that's really that's that's our responsibility uh, to ensure that we, uh, you know, we enable technology so that we help the people to, you know, come out of the poverty. And as per report, I'll tell you a report. Mpesa. We know Mpesa. It's a global phenomena. So it is as, as a report. People say that people who are staying near Mpesa agents, they are more successful in coming out of poverty. The people who are staying near the agent of Mpesa. So we have to ensure that we uh, enable. So Province is on a mission. We are coming out with a solution which will uh, help financial institutions to come out with this IT shared infrastructure. We provide obviously, you know, if one to one any any financial institution wants a solution, you know, for themselves, we are there to support them. We are working with the likes of MyBucks. We are working with the likes of Zaraco. You know, you know, uh, in East Africa, we are working with Awash Bank or you know, uh, you know, Abe Bank. Or if we go to West Africa, we work with uh, Ghana Commercial Bank. Or we are working with Lapo Microfinance. Okay, so these are the banks we are working in. Okay, so we provide a different kind of solution. But right now we are very much interested in giving it what Amy is giving in Rwanda. So we're looking forward, and if anyone is interested, we are ready to share our technology, share our experience, and Amy is also there to support us uh, to share his expertise. He's testing it right away. Khalila is there to support the guidance, the the policy framework from African Development Bank, and Sion is there with his strategy vision, strategic vision, and he is a big favor of POS agent banking. You know, he's a big, 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 you know, favor of POS agent banking. He believes, you know. Uh, customer should not reach to bank. The bank should reach to the customer. So that's uh, that's uh, you know on this note, I've, you know that's from my end. Profinch is there to support uh, with you know uh, support of African Development Bank and other people, uh, other organization in the ecosystem. We are there to provide technology partners. We are the technology partner to support any kind of banking needs that you have. And uh, we are very proud that um, we have over you know hundreds of customers. And still, our business fifty to sixty percent of our business comes as a repeat business from our existing customers. So the hundred percent success rate we have as a company, and uh, that's that's we are taking very proud. Uh, for me, uh, for Profinch, our projects uh, when we complete a project, that is not when we uh, say it's successful. When the customer gives me a repeat business, then I say it's successful because he has a trust on me. So that's what. On this note, I will uh, finish my point. Uh, Niranjan Khalila. Uh, uh, Amy, Sean, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks everyone on the uh, you know uh, attendees who joined the call, uh, joined the thing. Now we will be sharing this uh, video, uh, you know, web, web webinar window uh, video to everyone for your sake of you can go through it at your convenience. Or any questions you have, our email IDs, feel free to reach us. Uh, Niranjan, over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kranal. I think uh, it was a very insightful uh, session. Yeah, we are, we are, we are over time now. Uh, so, so again, I would want to you know thank everyone for taking time out to join the uh, webinar. I again thank our panelists for making this happen. Uh, 
you know as as krinal mentioned uh, we will we'll have the recording available for everyone soon all right uh, if you wish to get in touch with us you can always uh, visit us at uh, www.profinch.com uh, all right uh, now at profinch we do keep conducting a lot of webinars on various industry topics so if uh, uh, you know i i can suggest you to follow us on linkedin uh, you know our company page to get uh, uh, regular updates yeah so there's one last thing i want to mention that uh, we would be having a surprise gift for about three attendees whom we uh, pick through a lucky draw after the webinar so please keep an eye on your inboxes uh, we'll be sharing the details uh, with the winners uh, so till we meet again have a wonderful uh, day ahead uh, and thank you i'll i'll be closing the webinar now yeah, thank, you. thank you everyone thank, thank you. you bye thank you bye